Okay, you're still here. Excellent. Um, great. So let me introduce to you uh, Johannes Meinusch. Uh, you're CEO of a company called Commitment, and you're effecting, you're effecting participation, participative changes in organizations, right? And you're no. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Ah, uh, yes. That's what you're doing, right? In the, in, your, in the past, you've organized software development at Zing and at, at Otto. Yes. And I should point out, he has a black belt in PowerPoint karaoke. Wow. Yes. Right. And I don't. So. I'm a uh, consultant, you know, basically. I have, <laughs> I have no idea what's coming, so we'll see what yeah. happens. I I don't need to know shit about anything to talk about it. That's <laughs> consultancy. This is Mike Sperber. This is Sperber as a bird. And this is why he has this beautiful full Schwerber as a logo behind him. Minus does not mean gold, by the way. Um, and Mike, I know from conferences, because I was listening to talks I did not understand about functional programming, and developers that I hired were talking about Haskell and Monads, and I kept bugging Michael over the fifth glass of white wine. What is a monad? <laughs> he said, hope is a monad, and I was lost. <laughs> we then and I felt things, you know, not just being drunk, but also anxiety and stuff. So we talked about that, and then somehow we came up with the idea of giving a talk about programming and emotions. Emotions. And so we talk about emotions. That's basically how I feel, how I felt. I, I feel slightly better now after like the second talk and lots of wine and thinking about functional programming, but. Most of the time, when I, I who, who of you saw that talk about the, the guy who built the compiler in APL? Beautiful. And, and somebody even commented on closing brackets, which I found quite amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I felt shit in a way because I did not understand what this was on about. But it's inspiring. So, so we talk yeah. about emotions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so maybe, maybe. I mean, I'm sure you didn't come here to talk about emotions, but you came here to hear about code, right? That's, I feel much more comfortable with code. Yes, but right. the interesting thing is, and we have not talked about that, we're carrying around a kind of computer in our brain, which is kind of glibberish, the outside of our brain, it's called neocortex, and it has 20 billion processors, neurons in there, and we can code them, that is called learning. So what we have to do is a kind of arbitration over 20 billion processors within our own head. So in a way, and, and this is full of emotions. So I think coding. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about code instead. Can we, can we do that, please? <laughs> How do you feel uh, about that? Yeah, yeah. So, well, the thing is, code sometimes evokes emotions. So here's some code I wrote in I think 1987. Uh, so in an archaic programming language that I'm sure nobody recognizes anymore, which is uh, which is called C. Um, and um, so if you look at that piece of code. It's, it, try, it does a little bit of input-output, now looking at it, I instantly feel that there's lots of things wrong with it, right? It doesn't do any error handling, it tries to be cute about the names of the variables. So if you're not from Germany, Visa and Mosa, they're two German rivers, and I felt that these are about I.O. streams. <laughs> so, uh, so to my defense, I can say that I looked like this back then. This, but, uh, this was kind of, this, this even now, like 30, Hundred years later, it's <laughs> still funny. <laughs> so you had joy when you did that. Did you? There was a pun. Yeah. That somehow well, you were yeah, there's really there's driven. Yeah. I, yeah. There were some emotions involved. involved. And then but shame then, came along. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah speaking of which. Um, you, speaking of shame, yes. When I, I proudly <laughs> presented my piece of Go code to uh, Michael, he instantly the first thing he commented on. I was kind of proud that it kind of worked, actually. And um, the first thing is, why do you have a function? that is called update saldo. Um, and of course, <laughs> it, it sounds good, but it's, if you think about it, it's kind of scary because a saldo should always be update. You should not have a need to update it. And looking at the program some weeks later, indeed, there were lots of occurrences in my huge inherited program where it said update saldo and if I wasn't sure whether the saldo was actually updated, I put in another update saldo <laughs> so the program was full of update saldo. So I had a point and I, I removed lots of these update saldos and I kind of put this update saldo right in the booking thing so it doesn't occur anymore in the rest of the code but right. yeah, yeah, shame. Yeah, it made you feel like this, right? Yeah, it's shame. 
we had an argument whether uh, in English that feeling should really be called shame. Shame is sort of I am shit, uh, or maybe guilt would be better. You know, I did shit. Um, so <laughs> certainly did that uh, in our careers, right? Um, the thing is, if you would look at this program now, I could probably present the removal of update Zaldo, but I'm kind of scared to show it to you because you immediately find the next yeah. Yeah. fuck up in the code. <laughs> so here, one, one and a half feelings that we might associate with the code that, yeah. well, they tell us about the code of the past. They might motivate us to want to do better, but uh, one of the questions is how can we leverage feelings, not just to point us away from the bad things, but towards the good things. And why would we even talk about feelings? We, we didn't practice that, but the thing is, uh, computers are driven by code. Mammals are driven by emotions, yet we are mammals who code computers. So if we want to improve coding computers, we kind of have to learn that it's program ourselves. So we have to consider emotions. Yeah, absolutely. So here's somebody who programmed. I don't know if you saw that. That video went viral sometime in January, I think. Um, and uh, a, 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 an American gymnast called Caitlin Ohashi, who did this gymnastics routine, she'd almost um, uh, she'd almost terminated her career because she wasn't feeling very good about what she was doing anymore. But I, I hardly recommend that you watch that video because you see somebody using their emotions to get something amazing done, right? Yeah. And, and so the question is, can we do something similar for programming? Can we find out what emotions help us be uh, better programmers? And um, so one aspect of that is that emotions, well, from an evolutionary perspective, emotions are there to sort of steer us in the direction of fulfilling basic human needs, right? And so nowadays, of course, as computer people, we can just look up what human needs are on Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> when you talk about human needs, are you still talking about one individual human, like myself, or are you already into the society thing where you have more humans that you're talking about? Well, there's different human needs, and at least one of them is participation. Yes, but That's your thing, right? Yeah, and, and the thing is, if you want to become better coders, or if we even think about working in teams, who's done pair programming recently? Ah, some do a mob programming. So you do something in groups with other people. Now, did I mention these 20 billion processors in your head that you have to kind of, if you, if you want to go to truth, like in Nicole's talk previously, you have to do an arbitration over 20 billion neurons. Now, there's another 20 billion neurons sitting next to you, which is kind of badly connected to your 20 billion neurons. And you have to communicate, and emotions come into that again. Absolutely, yeah. So if you, if you don't like each other, we won't do any pair programming, mate. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to do any pair programming anyway. Why so. Not? <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll do that, I promise. Thanks. Um, I buy the wine. So anyway, so we sort of narrowed it down to four things that were, or the three things, right? If this, the first one's the headings. Three things that we're going to talk about a little bit. And we're going to start with the last one, with creation, right? Yes, creation. And this is, th these are your toes, right? Yeah, this is, these are my toes in, in, in January in a warm country with sand and beaches and palms and stuff. You have another, another thought of that. So if you learn a new programming language, I'm actually, if, if somebody has a tip for me, I'm still looking for, for my next one because Mike told me Go is a shitty programming language because it's not functional. <laughs> and Peter said it's a retard back to the 90s, so we kind of get bashing for Go. So I want something better. What I need is a functional programming language that comes as easy as Go and does, that does cross-compilation on Raspberry Pi. So I would like that a lot. Okay. But anyway, if you learn something new, I would expect something like a Hello World, and then I would go and program Hello World. Now, I have a Hello World here, and I, I'm not sure whether you recognize the programming language. There are a couple of hints. <laughs> hints are the numbers. Do you actually know why, why they numbered them 10, 20, 30, 40? This is for refactoring. That's anticipating that you have nine lines of refactoring in between the line of code. Um, anyway. <laughs> really? <laughs> I am Seriously. Serious. This was the 80s, right? <laughs> so who was programming in the 80s in this room? Uh, well, oh, too many people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So how many times does that print Hello World? Five times. Because we start counting at one, which is Uncommon, if you would have started counting at zero, yeah. it would be safe. But anyway, I do that. I push some bits and bytes around, and magically the computer says, hello world, hello world, hello world, hello world, hello world. And it kind of makes me feel powerful. 
and creative because I created something, I have the power to command the machine, so I'm a creator. And by programming dumb machines, I create them. If I become a better programmer, I might invent artificial intelligence and get machines to program themselves. So this would be a creator who has produced something that can recreate or procreate itself. So as a creator, I'm a kind of god, right? So is coding, now you can put it on, the question is, is coding the sex of gods? <laughs> in a way, sometimes it feels that way, right? Yeah. The thing is, where are all the gods gone? Yeah, that's kind of scary, you know? <laughs> Anyway, right. uh, this, is, this is what coding sometimes feel to me. It feels to me. It makes me powerful. It makes me creative. I can do something. In a virtual space, I mean, all the territorial space is invaded by humankind anyway, but I have a billion of us, but there's lots of space in the virtual space which we can still, you know, yeah. be creative and yeah. become gods. So that was one of the basic needs, was, was yeah. the need to create something. Procreation. Right? Uh, I mean, I think we saw on the previous slide with the basic program, is we all like to think of, especially when we do functional programming, of programming as this conceptual activity or this modeling activity. Uh, but in fact, um, uh, I think we have some quotes by Marshall McLuhan, who's, yes. who did a lot of theory on communication. And a right. quote widely attributed to him, but not by him, says, uh, well, we shape our tools and our tools shape us. So inevitably, the medium that we choose for our programs becomes part of our creation. So we can't, it's really very difficult to separate those two things. Yeah. Right. That's actually um, when he, when he, Marshall McLuhan again when he talked about the global village in the '60s, he coined the phrase, "The medium is the message." That's right. Um, so in in terms of a Unix admin, I would say the PS command is not as important, or the grep find thing command is not as important as as the pipe in between. So the pipe kind of defines <coughs> what my Unix operating system is like in the way I think because it's the medium. Marshall McLuhan, of course, used it to proclaim a new human society, a global village. Uh, and he hasn't right. even seen the internet. I think he died right. before the So that, that segues kind of neatly into the need to participate, right? To cooperate with other people to get those 20 billion yeah. uh, neurons connected, brain cells connected it's more with brain cells else's. than people. Yeah, so how do you do that? So how does programming reflect that, right? And um, well, uh, I'm sure we all agree. We've given this talk at a different conference where people are called OOP. And it needed saying that uh, objects are essentially static entities. Uh, well, they might send messages to each other, but they're really, uh, they're really insulated, isolated entities with encapsulated state. I think they're so, not so proud that the o, one of the O's and the OOP actually means object. Object, yeah. yeah. Well, maybe so, we should make a FOOP out of it, a FOOP yeah. conference. Yeah. 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 We, we should, yeah. Post we should do that at some point, right? But uh, the point is really that this, um, even though it seems intuitive, object-oriented programming doesn't really connect very well to either uh, our notion of perception. There's an entire different, entirely different talk there. I think Nicole pointed out to me uh, a while ago that also, I mean, the way that we humans uh, communicate about lots of concrete situations is via stories, right? And object-oriented programming does not really uh, does not really relate to any notion of storytelling. Well, it kind of rips stories apart talks about dots on eyes, yeah, right? something like that. Or maybe it encapsulates dots on yeah. eyes. Whereas in functional programming, right, we're really proud that we can compose things. And there have been a bunch of talks today about composition and how you can wire uh, functions together. Um, and you want to point out that it's that this logarithm yes, is yeah, it is, I did what When I looked at that the first time, I didn't understand what, what the logarithm of a cosine is. I yeah. thought that but kind it, of it's fails. for input, I am, right? It's, it's not a natural logarithm. just a simple yeah. form. <laughs> anyway. So this is one of the problems that makes me always feel bad about functional programming. It's, it's I sit the there, and, and, and I look at it, and it kind of does not penetrate beyond my eyeballs. Okay. <laughs> so, but now, now that you know that it says input. Right? Yes, I feel you better. Can, you, yeah, I feel better, right? So that's good. Unfortunately, the thing is, just using functional programming is not just going to magically uh, you know, turn your uh, turn your program into a social system that we can relate to. So here's some uh, some other code that I wrote in 1997. Uh, if you recognize it, it is written in a functional language, it's written in Scheme. Uh, but um, no, comparatively, how do you feel about this code compared to the first from 10 years earlier? Because uh, remember, oh, you have been 10 years into programming at that stage. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, I feel much crappier about this code because I should have known better. 
Uh, it's a song. Yeah. You actually, you can't see this. You can't actually move because there's some embarrassing line. <laughs> 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 Well, it's so, it's really, so really what we want in order to relate to code, to use code as a medium of, of communication and participation, uh, uh, really we want code that talks about the ideas, right? The ideas of our problem domain or maybe abstract ideas. And, and the thing is, I mean, people try to an, unambiguously communicate ideas before there were even computers, right? And, and that might scare some people. It doesn't scare people here in this room, but among software developers, people sometimes get scared by the idea that math was originally conceived for that purpose, right? I really um, like that. I mean, you have to repeat that. I did not understand that beforehand, but Mike put to me this idea that math is the functional, or say, the, the abstract language of philosophy, right? I kind of liked it because yeah. you know this Wikipedia coin, if you click on Wikipedia on the terms by 12 times, uh, if, you, if you look up something and you, you take the first hyperlink and you click on it, and if you do that for 12 times, you always go to philosophy. Almost always the end, the, the, the source is philosophy. So math must be very close to philosophy. Yeah. And I thought, in a way, emotions, coming back to the emotional part, is uh, the functional language of mammals. OK. Because that's what, I mean, when you grow up, the first picture, you're very small, you feel pain hunger, coldness, and bliss. OK. Right? Uh -huh. So these are, this, is, this is the first experience you have. So why do we ever evolve as mankind from this emotional state into a mathematical state where we try to abstract yeah. that? The, the funny thing is math, 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 mathematicians <laughs> also have had a lot of experience dealing with emotions. Uh, so if you read, read German, there's a recent article on a German mathematician, and there's an emotion right there in the introduction, right? And, uh, and yeah. we debated whether we should translate it as uh, humiliation. Yeah. Uh, well, it does mean humiliation. Dignity? Right? No, no, no. Uh, it means humiliation, but it's from humility? Yeah, humility. 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 Well, Which is it, a good emotion, actually. Well, the funny thing is there is a good emotion that goes with demutibong, which is demut, right? Which has not the negative yeah. connotations of demutibong. And, uh, and there's, there's a point there because that same uh, term terminology confusion exists in English, right? You have humility and you have humiliation. So what I um, like about that phrase is that even super brains in mathematics kind of feel uh, funny or weird when they leave their very special area and go to a different area because they might not understand everything. Yeah, exactly. So remember, maybe remember me that at some point at the talk I have to talk about my perfume because it also has something to do with emotions. Okay, I will do that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so something closely related to humility, maybe, is, a, is, is an emotion that you might call the fear of vulnerability. Yes. Is in, uh, you know, you put, uh, you put code out that you don't, maybe don't like so much anymore, or you expose yourself to the possibility that you're not understanding something that's complicated or deep or APL uh, or something <laughs> like that. And, um, and that's actually, you know, that's one of the biggest fails that we can make because what it what happens is anxiety kills curiosity. You could be curious about something that you don't understand and say, like if when a magician turns up at the stage and does magic tricks, many people ask, how do you do that? Tell me how you did it. Tell me, I need to know. But you could just sit and wonder in awe and say, that is a beautiful trick. I just did not get it, but it was beautiful how I was tricked. Become curious and try to learn things. If you feel shame, vulnerability, you always easily tend to, I don't want to touch it because it means, makes me feel bad. It's a shitty thing. I'm a such and such programmer. I know about this, but I hate this because I don't understand it. Don't fear things that you don't understand, but become curious yeah. about them. There yeah. might be something in it. Yeah. And I think we all have that tendency to clam up when there's something that we think is ridiculously complicated. So we can't APL programmers. For example, right? Yeah. I think we all felt that impulse, right? To sort of laugh at it because it's, it, it looked complicated. Yeah, but I think if we allow ourselves the possibility to sort of sink into that, and, and, and of course that always comes with the possibility that, that we will fail, um, then something good might come out of that. So, so there's, there's, I think, our first message is to not clam up, but um, to, to allow vulnerability 
as you're getting into things, right? So here's how I felt about Monats when I first heard about them, like the first two years of Monats, not being a programmer at that stage, I think. What does it say? The Monad monster, I eat steak for breakfast, I'm so abstract, you cannot see me coming. I feed, feed me functions, I implement them into my digestive system, I output more Monads, and I'm kind I don't know, feel so as friendly as your dog, yeah. right? It's yeah. kind of yeah, so, so it, might be, it might be that there's a long path from Go programming to Monads, right? Yes. So it'd be nice if there were some... At some, least there is a path. If there would be some, yeah, there's a path, right? If there, if there were some positive feelings along the way, if we would get some, some shots of dopamine, Yes, right? I like dopamine. Who okay. has experienced dopamine recently? <laughs> a lot of you, hopefully. Right? Hopefully everybody, because it's something, or you, you, you don't need to externally inhale it. This is also a way to do it, but your body produces it. Yeah. So, so it's the it's it, it's the chemical that you get the shot of when you've succeeded at something. Maybe something that's that's been slightly challenging. Maybe not as challenging as monads coming from gold, but yeah. you know, small things sometimes, okay. right? Maybe you need dopamine. So, so maybe maybe we can use dopamine to help us get to monads. And I worked so hard at this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a black belt in PowerPoint karaoke, but maybe in PowerPoint now. So um, anyway, so here's here's some kids experiencing. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really a great, that has been great experience, teaching kids in the hacker school to program. And we use Scratch. Who has ever seen Scratch? Nice programming language. It's easy to learn. Easier than PHP, actually. And they started off, and I think after two days, one and a half days in hacker school, they programmed this knight and dragon computer game, um, and you could actually play it. Yeah, it, it was a one-level game, and it, it, you weren't able to refill your lessons, but anyway. So, dopamine Yeah, in action, I would say right? dopamine, dopamine in action, right? So maybe, um, maybe what happens when you get this kind of project finish is, is you feel very proud, right? You've actually succeeded at putting program elements together that will do something constructive. Yeah, at this point, you always pose the cardinal question: Is yeah. this really good? Just to feel dopamine. Yeah. Yeah. Do so, you produce good programs with Scratch? Where's the bigger idea? You know, yeah. where's the mathematics behind Knights and Dragons? <laughs> yeah. Well, there, I mean, there is that idea, right? The question is, looking at the code, will you recognize the idea? No. Right. <laughs> and, and the answer is sometimes no. So, so maybe. Pride can help us along the way, but it should not be the final end, not the emotional final end product. Of well, the you, 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 with, with that, you get into the dopamine state, yeah. but not into the monad state. Not into the monad state. That's a good point. Of course, in order to get into the monad state, we got to do functional programming. Yeah. And the funny thing is, uh, so a prominent. Take it away now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, a prominent functional programmer, Jarnason, actually, he, was, uh, he had uh, feelings as part of his talk uh, a while ago. And, and he did a little survey among functional programmers, how functional programming made them feel, and they all had these positive things to say, right? So it's not, so, so somehow it made them feel good. On the other hand, I mean, I, I showed you that really not very functional code that was written in a functional language, but even functionally functional, functional code, right? Sometimes looks like this, right? Uh, so this is a co-group and it, if you can't read it, it's, it's just a lot of code on something, something, category theory with iterities and all kinds of other things, right? Nice so, long names. what? Hmm? Nice not long names. And nice long names, yeah. So, so, I, so it, that makes even me feel like this. Right? <laughs> um, anyway. That was so, 10 years later, that was 2007, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Uh, yeah, in, in, indeed. So, we're, gonna, we're, we're just going to talk about an alternative approach. Um, on, on images um, put forth by, by a good friend of mine, Connell Elliott, and he has this little gallery of images, and you sort of get a conceptual idea of what he's doing, right? You have pictures, they, they have a background, there's something in the foreground, and a lot of them sort of come from mathematical transformations, uh, sometimes of actual photos here, but sometimes they're just purely mathematically generated, right? So, so we all have this idea of an image, right? <coughs> And if you look at a typical object-oriented formulation of an image, then, for example, here's a part of the Java API, uh, and it says, draw an oval, right? And you have this idea in your head of an ellipse, maybe, or an oval. But 
this function or this method has very little to do with it because uh, it just changes the colors of a bunch of pixels, right? There's no entity corresponding to the oval uh, that has to do, that comes out of calling that method or something. Right. There's no higher mathematical cause to draw a oval. Yeah, there's no higher cause period, cause period, right? I think behind this. So um, here's a picture of Connell. Um, and does that look like a positive feeling? So if you've met Connell, uh, that feeling transfers to you. So he's, he knows something that we don't uh, uh, clearly. So he has this idea called denotational design, and it, it's very, it, it comes across as very simple in that. Well, you have entities in, in the world of your domain, and you just make type definitions, and you don't fill them out yet. Right? You just say, well, I'm going to decide later what a reasonable type is, what a reasonable type definition is. I'm just going to put three dots there. And uh, before I think about what those three dots are, well, maybe more, more uh, entities might come up. So uh, we might have a, so we saw before, well, we are going to have something called an image. These images obviously are dealing with colors, or we might have a type de definition for colors. And then he thinks about operations uh, on the entities of our world. So in this case, well, we need a couple of constructors to make very simple pictures. So there's something. It's all right, go on. Keep going. I was okay. just reading. Yeah. So, so there's something called the empty image, right, which is just a prefabricated empty image. And you can make a monochrome image from a color. So even here, well, of course, you don't have the type definitions yet, so you can't write function definitions yet. You just put the type signatures down. So this says, given a color, I can make a monochrome picture. Uh, you might notice that these images, they're not, they don't have any boundaries, right? They just, um, uh, they just in extend into, uh, into the plane infinitely. And we might actually have a constructor that takes some real number, that is the radius, that takes a color, and then creates an image. Uh, we should more precisely say it's a disk, so we're not thinking about the outline of the circle, but we're thinking about the I was actually looking at the comparison R where you define mm -hmm. what kind of colors yeah. you fill, because yeah. I had that misunderstanding when I read yeah. your code first, that I thought if it's infinite space, and if you just draw a line, then you will not be able to see it, because yeah. it's yes. infinitely thin. small, yeah, that's right. but you actually yeah. fill everything inside the line. Yeah, that's so that you can see something. Also, uh, I mean, we're all, I mean, when we design a functional language, this is not, nothing deep, is we always look for combinators. So we have our entities, and we try to combine our entities into sort of larger or derived entities. So an easy combinator is we have two images, and we put them on top of each other. So there's a combinator <laughs> called over. It takes an image, takes another image, and produces another image. And we might also think of an operation called crop that just sort of cuts out a piece of an image. And that means we're going to need to specify the shape that it cuts out. And that shape in this world is called a region. Okay? And, uh, and again, there's a combinator. It takes a region, takes an image, and spits out another image where, well, we just see what's inside the region. We don't see what's outside the region. And once we have that, well, once we've collected a bunch of operations that are useful in our domain, then we can think about mapping our domain into some kind of, and that's where the math comes in, into some kind of mathematical or concrete domain. Doing functional programming, that mathematical domain can often just be an object in our functional language, so there's no, uh, um, uh, there's no impedance mismatch here. So in this case, uh, the mathematics is just written down also as Haskell code or, or code or as Haskell pseudocode, if you will, in that, well, the, the, the main thing is, again, the type signature, which says the meaning of an image is a function that goes from a location in the two-dimensional plane to a color. So you can also see that it doesn't just extend infinitely. It also has sort of infinite resolution. If a location indeed just is a pair of two real numbers, right, if you think of it. So we're not talking about IEEE 754 flows. We're really just using Haskell to write down a bunch of math when we're thinking of the real numbers. And since we have a bunch of combinators, we can talk about, uh, and constructors, we can talk about the meaning of images in terms of all of those functions. So that's the next step in denotational design. So for example, the empty image, you now need to map that empty image to a function, and that function must accept a location and produce a color. And you can immediately see if the image is empty, and you remember we had this combinator where we put two images on top of each other, is that these images need to feature transparency in some sense. So there needs to be a special color called clear um, that is just transparent or translucent or whatever. So now I would have the, un not, this is not dopamine yet, yeah. but I get the anticipation of dopamine 
Yeah. So go on. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we're getting there. I, oh, I remember, I should have listened to when he called it, actually, and spelled out the names, I remember, and then I got stuck organizing this conference. <laughs> you just going to have to deal with me. But you're right, uh, Nicole, by the way. Should have spelled out the names. Um, um, so, um, so we had a discussion about domain-driven design in functional programming. And uh, functional programmers like to write very short names, especially Haskell programmers. And these should have been wrong. They're wrong. Um, so anyway, so a monochrome picture is very easy. So it has a color C in the middle. Uh, so it's, it's, it has that color C everywhere. So it's just a function that will always return that color C, no matter what the coordinates are. And if you have a circle, and that's where we can see that it's really a disk and not just the outline, is, is we calculate the magnitude, the distance from the center. Um, and if that is less or equal than the radius, then we will return some color C. And otherwise, we will return transparency. And then it gets slightly more complicated for the square, but you can sort of guess where it's going. Just press a box in the coordinates that go on. Right? Just, re just think about, I, I was just thinking about how to debug it if you just wrote equal and you don't see the yeah. disk and you don't see yeah. the circle. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see some notes here. So, um, well, it gets more, oh, well, so if we have the meaning of this over combinator, two images, we need to, if we put two images on top of each other, we really need to explain what that over operation means in terms of some combinator that on the colors themselves, right? Because you always put two colors on top of each other. And so there needs to be an over C combinator that takes a color, takes another color, spits out a combined color. And, um, and it gets really interesting when you see what a reasonable interpretation of a region is. Well, for a region, we're interested in what of the picture is inside and what is outside. So we can just represent that as a Boolean for every location. So the meaning for regions just maps from region to a function from locations to Booleans. And then the crop operation just looks at the meaning of the region at a location. And if it's inside, if that returns true, it will give us the color of the image. And otherwise, it will give us transparency. OK, so far? So that's the dopamine, dopamine point. Actually. Yeah, well, the dopamine point, we get to the next dopamine point here because the great thing about mathematics and functional programming is, well, we do the, all this based on our idea of the domain, but now we can take a step back and sort of relax and forget about the domain for a moment and see that the definition, the meaning, uh, the meanings, the denotations for regions and for images are very similar. They both go from ha 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 to location to something. And in one case, that something is color, and in the other case, that something is bool, right? So, we can just abstract and just have a type image and then specialize and have the type parameter in there. And uh, we can then specialize that type parameter to create new definitions for an image over colors. So we're just going to rename that. And um, uh, also uh, can instantiate it to bool for creating a region. And the neat thing then is um, then, uh, so, so now we've, we've abstracted something. Right? And that, I don't, I'm not sure I feel pride at this point because we've discovered something that was already there. Right? I think that is a deeper feeling. Yeah, but I mean, this is, uh, this is kind of the dopamine of mathematicians. They always discover things that yeah. are already there. Right. Like physicists, same yeah, thing. Sort of, right? <laughs> so having stepped away from the domain, we can think of combinators that are, um, that are more abstract, if you will, that are, that are not immediately connected to a concrete idea of the domain. So you might think of an Im of a conditional operator, which you know it doesn't talk about images or it doesn't talk about the regular images or the regions. It just talks about any image over any A. I have to go back to uh, to the last statement. We just okay. proved that dopamine um, release in your brain is not a function of discovery but of learning. Good point. So Columbus did not discover America. Right? He learned that it was yeah, there. He okay. learned that it was there. Right? Okay. Okay. So, so you can see that we can define functions that have nothing to do with any concrete uh, idea of what an image is, but they are abstracted over what's sort of at every single location, right? And then we can go back and see that a lot of the combinators that we've defined, especially if you like duck for a moment, uh, yeah, like that, we can suddenly see that a lot of the stuff that we've already defined can be redefined. Uh, in terms of the combinators that we've now created. Right? And um, so we've discovered something. And of course, looking at it from a mathematical standpoint, we're going to look for uh, the M word, the simple M word. Uh, 
which is we're going to look for a monoid uh, in just about everything that we do. And uh, Kono calls this a tau check. You should always look for a monoid. Um, and for a monoid, well, what do you need? You might remember, well, a monoid is this thing. It has a binary operation, right? Uh, that is this thing with the two angle brackets. And it must have what's usually called in mathematics a neutral element that if you use it with a binary operation, will just give you the same thing back. And there's an associative law, right? And um, most people sort of remember that from school. As functional programmers, we're, we should always look for that. And so um, the thing is we should look for, uh, a, specifically, we should look for a combinator, this binary operation there, if we have that in our domain, right? And of course, uh, we have that. We have this over function that takes two images, produces another image. And we can immediately check whether that will give us a model. If we have that operation, we're also going to need to look for a neutral element. And we have that empty image that is transparent everywhere. So if we slap that on top of another image, then we'll just get the same image back. And we could also prove associativity. But remember that we abstract it, right? We abstract it over the concrete sort of member type of the image. And so, I mean, and we also had that over combinator, over C combinator on colors. So we might also think about uh, turning that into a monoid. We're not going to do that today. And the thing is, if the A is a monoid, right, we can make any image of A into a monoid as well, right? And so, so by just defining the monoid on color, we can leave out the definition that we had before and just use this one, which is now abstract, and which doesn't correspond to a concrete notion, right? And so we're learning things now, right? And if we had more time, we would learn that, well, we have this thing with a type parameter. So when there's a thing with a type parameter, we always look for something called a functor. And there's other algebraic entities that we could look for. Uh, up to monads and co-monads. And monads and co-monads, they force you to think about this notion of an image of images, right? Which has no counterpart in the concrete world, but which makes complete sense from an abstract standpoint, it gives you useful operations on images. So I'm just going to hint at that. So, so you can use mathematics and functional programming to go back and forth uh, between the domain and sort of deeper insights about your domain and your learning stuff. And um, but we were here about to talk about emotions, yes. right? So yes. Yeah. Why not shut else? me up over the last yeah. ten yeah. slides? Yeah, we were very quiet. And uh, the thing that I learned now is that I, okay, I can get used to these things, yeah. and when I'm used to it, maybe at, in s some night it will make click in my brain, and I will not s get a better understanding. Well, let me suggest it's, it's more it's more of a it's more continuous process, right? Yeah. But uh, so Kama has this idea. So there's this paradox here in that well, I mean. Emotions imply that there's a human there, right? And Carl does something that removes the human designer out of the design process. So does, how does that work, right? It's, uh, so it's obvious, I mean, this is something uh, I think is good for the code, but what happens with our emotions? And I think it's just the fact that this learning just creates a deeper emotion than the pride that we have. And a lot of the emotions that we talked about don't really have good names. Uh, so we figure we're just going to have to make a little table. Right? Yes, and, we thought uh, we, we'd do something which had been famous 17 years ago. Yeah, so uh, this is it. Years ago. Um, so we invented an emotional programming manifesto. Yeah, which we intend to market shamelessly. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so, <laughs> And this is not happening in Utah, but in Berlin. <laughs> in Berlin, exactly, yeah. Well, have you been to Snowboard and Snowbird? It's, let me do some parallel no, myself. I, I, I felt these 17 hole. people were bored uh, shitlessly when they invented the Agile yeah, Manifesto. Yeah, and like that. Anyway, so what is meant there? It's not the courage to do something dangerous. It's the courage to fail, right? You should set your, you should feel OK about failing. Uh, and, and, uh, and as much as you can set yourself up for failure, you will, it, it becomes actually more probable that you will succeed. And uh, you should prefer that over shame, this idea that I'm never going to understand this thing, right? Whether it be monads uh, or uh, or something else, um, and that that also means that you should allow yourself to be vulnerable. Maybe you talk to other people about it, about your failure to understand something, uh, and that makes you feel vulnerable because sometimes people exploit that. But uh, ultimately, it will give us it will give us deeper insights and hopefully better code. Well, actually, it will give you the freedom to learn. Whereas where yeah. if you feel hubris, you're so full of yourself that there's no space for learning left. Yeah. Right? Yeah. There's no need for that. Yeah. And so, uh, so pride maybe is on the way to good code, but really you should look for that deeper feeling that comes from having discovered something. Um, 
maybe where the human designer doesn't play such a fundamental role anymore. Actually, it's a hope that bliss is there at the end of the journey yeah. somewhere. Yeah. So, uh, Johannes, you came up with this great sentence. Yes. So I think emotional programming is the way to turn joyful nerds into functional designers. So stay tuned to, emo to your emotions. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. think there is any, at least not known to me, any research on that. Being a consultant and working a lot with teens, and that's actually coining the thing that I wanted to t tell about my perfume. I do something, I mean, what we do is we bring people together and make them feel good and talk about technology and talk to people who are not technologists in their team about technology and do architectural decisions and to kind of function out with team architects and gremium work, round tables where they can make big decisions for all the teams, but not to decide too much and leave free space. All of that is a function of feeling well in the environment. If you have one of these people not feel, feeling comfortable in that, in that room, you're, you're basically your workshop will go corrupt. So what we do as one of the methods is like consent-driven decisions. We take care that nobody says, I'm against it, and we take a decision nonetheless. So we try to take everybody in. Now, if you think learning and arbitrating 20 billion brain cells is kind of difficult, think twice. Because if you have 10 people times 20 billion brain cells t times a very ineffective way of communication, like with two words per second, that's the speed of our communication, right? Not counting misunderstanding, then you know that emotions play a role to communicate better, to get a better understanding. So the fun thing is, I listened to a podcast recently from Tim Pritlove, I don't know the Forscher Guys podcast, but he interviewed a guy from the Ruhr Uni Bochum, old guy, professor, who is uh, into He's, he's doing research on to smell perception, Riechforschung, whatever. The only guy who does that in Germany. And he has decoded um, one pheromone. People can smell different things, but pheromones you don't smell. Pheromones you receive in your nose, nostrils, and they are directly connected with your brain. So you, re you act on them. And Mankind, people can differentiate between, I think, five or six pheromones. Dogs and mice can have a can, can uh, sense 100. So he decoded only one that went through the press. And it's not the sex pheromone, which everybody thinks about. But he says what they found out is that this kind of pheromone triggers confluence between people. So if you're in a meeting oh. and you, you smell that, you're kind of more cooperative, more open for communication. So I immediately bought one of these RUB perfume bottles because they produce the perfume. <laughs> and every time I do a workshop now, I go and myself, and it somehow magically works a lot better. <laughs> so yes, I think there's a connection between emotions and, and, and perceptiveness. And I think all of us who have been in program for a long time know these kind of lonely nerd phenomenons who don't like to talk to managers, but that's not the way how we develop products and software nowadays. This is a very cooperative process, meanwhile. So I think, yeah, um, and emotions always get in the way, or you can use them to make everybody feel better. And it's not about harmony all the time, but about curiosity, and also about differences, because from a difference, you can learn. You can say, okay, we don't agree, you bug me, but let's talk about it, because there's something that I don't see that I, that I could learn. Yeah. Long answer for a complicated question. Well, you, wanted no, that that's research. you wanted to get that perfume. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, huh? The state of um, business and curiosity somehow driven, reminds me of the emotional state of the mind. I have to speak mind. up. Okay. Sorry. The emotional state of the mind. We can repeat. Go on. Okay. Like this emotional state of
Okay. Yes, you yeah. should because uh, as a mathematics student, you leave university full of ideas, of knowledge, of curiosity, and you go to an insurance company in the mathematical <laughs> department, <laughs> and you have to wear ties <laughs> and kind of not show emotions anymore. <laughs> yeah, good point. I'm not sure. Little children always have no social problems. <laughs> yeah, children. So no, we actually. We need to take the rest offline. People are pointing at me from the back.